Hello. Okay. Good evening, everyone. I'm used to saying good morning. It's kind of weird to say good evening. But um, it's so good to see you guys and see some extra visitors in the room tonight. Um, this is our Faces of History, and this is actually my first Faces of History event as well. Um, so I'm excited to experience it with you all. But basically, our essential students, who are our 9 to 12 year olds, have been working hard at, um, on writing papers about a American, a person who has influenced American history. And um, they've been working on this paper. And then they come here in costume. And they've written a paper with all these facts, but they're not going to give away who their character is. And so at the end of their speech, uh, you guys will all get a chance to guess who it is. Um, please be quiet until they ask, who am I? And please also refrain from using your phone to uh, pick up some clues. We're just going to keep uh, our attention on the speakers tonight and kind of practice the presentation skills that we do during presentation time. Um, so I think that is all the instructions for tonight. We will uh, let all the kids go up. When you guys are done, you guys will head over there and um, get your picture taken and then head to your seats. I think that's the way it goes right here. Um, and thank you so much, Shannon, for taking their pictures. We're excited about that. Um, all right, so I will open us in prayer and then I will um, have our two, well, I'll introduce our tutors for a minute to you guys. This is Miss Carla Yoder and she is teaching one class or tutoring. And our other tutor is Miss Jill Ellis. And we are so thankful for everything you guys have done. Um, tonight is a celebration of all the hard work you guys have put into the students too this year. So um, let me open us in prayer. And then I'll have Carla come up and introduce her class. Dear Lord, I thank you so much for the opportunity to get together tonight. I thank you for this community and all the students represented tonight. I thank you for their hard work and... Um, for the chance to celebrate their hard work and to uh, give us an opportunity to enjoy the work that they put in this year. I thank you for Carla and for Jill and everything that they poured into these students and into making this year a success. I thank you for the parents who have invested so much so that their children can have a wonderful Christian education. And I pray that you would uh, bless this night. May it bond us all together in unity with each other and with you, and uh, give us a spirit of gratitude for all these blessings that you have given us. Um, please bless everyone tonight. I pray that you would give them calm and uh, excitement, and may we just have a joyful experience together. For Jesus' sake, amen. All right, Miss Carla, come on up. Well, good evening. I'm Carla Yoder, and um, this is my class, and they have done an excellent job this year um, on their characters. So our characters are in chronological order. They start in the early 1700s and go all the way up to present times. So without further ado, Brian, come on up. An innovative founding father. How many things have you invented? Born January 17th, 1706, I was a 16th son in a large family. I dropped out of school at an early age because my parents could not afford to educate their numerous children. To ease the family's finances, I was apprenticed to my brother at age 12 for 10 pounds and nine years of work. The Huron words helped me become an impeccable writer. Naturally smart and curious, I enjoyed learning how things worked. This curiosity led me to invent many practical items. My curiosity with grammar and words helped me lead men in forming a new country. I created many things. One of these things was bifocals. These were a type of glasses which helped people read and see. Cinema was important to me, so I also invented flippers and the Franklin stove. The Franklin stove made wood safer to burn inside houses. 
Ingeniously, I crafted the amazing magic squared, which is an 8x8 grid of numbers, precisely made so that when the numbers are added horizontally, vertically, or diagonally, it always adds up, always adds up to 260. I made an instrument called the harmonica, which is made of different thickness and of glass bowls. I also invented daylight savings time because I thought it would make sense to have an extra hour of sunlight in the summer to work. I was an ingenious inventor. Clearly, I played an important role in the American Revolution and the formation of the new country, the United States. I was a member of the Second Continental Congress, which made decisions about how the new country would run. On July 4, 1776, I, along with other members of the Continental Congress, signed the Declaration of Independence because we wanted to be free from Britain's rule. Disagreeing on how the country should be run, the delegates of the Constitutional Convention were unsure how to proceed with the governance of the new country. However, I helpfully delivered a speech persuading the delegates to deport the newly drafted Constitution. I was successful. I also signed the Treaty of Paris in 1783, which ended the Revolutionary War and recognized the United States as a new country. Since I played an esteemed role in this country's history, I should be recognized as a prominent American. I was an ingenious inventor. America could not be the same with, without me who played an important role in the revolution. My most significant contribution to humanity was the Franklin stove because it was stove was safer than open hearth fire and more efficient method of heat. It greatly prevented many house fires and used less fuel, making it more affordable to the common American. America has been truly blessed to such, have such an innovative founding father. Who am I? Yes. Yes, I forgot a uh, title, but anyway. It's good to be home. I was born just down the road in Stewart Strauss, Virginia, sometime between 1770 and 1775. My life was filled with adventure, but I was not much of a writer. Stories about me are often exaggerated. I had become a legend, the iconic mountain man. My most notable achievements were traveling with the Lewis and Clark expedition, discovering Yellowstone, and surviving the perilous dangers of the West. I was indispensable to the core of discovery. On October 15th, 1803, when I was around 30 years old, I signed up for the adventure of a lifetime. Lewis and Clark were traveling along the Ohio River near present-day Louisville, Kentucky, when I joined the expedition. My commanding officer was Sergeant Pryor, and my first assignment was rowing the keelboat. Soon, though, they recognized my ability as a hunter and I took the job of keeping my comrades well fed. I proved myself capable and trustworthy and kept calm in stressful situations like facing down a boring grizzly bear, finding way, way through uncharted territories and negotiating with potentially hostile native tribes. My time with the Corps of Discovery ended when I joined a small group of trappers I met on our return trip along the Missouri River near, in present day North Dakota. They invited me to join their hopefully profitable hunt for beaver back west along the Yellowstone River. Captains Clark and Lewis granted my request to leave the expedition on the condition that no one else asked to do the same. Thus ended my service in the Corps of Discovery. From August 1806 to May 1810, I remained in the interior of the country, exploring the vast lands unknown to my countrymen in the east. After leaving the expedition, I spent the winter trapping beaver along the Yellowstone River with Forrest Hancock. We parted the ways the following spring. I was once again traveling along the Missouri River back to St. Louis when I met a fur trader named Manuel Lisa and his latest expedition. They requested that I join their party. I readily agreed, and together we headed back toward the Yellowstone River. We built a fort at the mouth of the Bighorn River 
named Fort Raymond after Emmanuel Lisa's son. Upon completion of the fort, Lisa sent me on an assignment to inform the nearby native tribes about the, new, about the fort as a new trading post. Despite it already being winter, I trudged up the Shoshone River, across the mountains into an area known as Jackson Hole, uh, in, into present-day Utah and looping back to Yellowstone Lake. I spent the entire winter in the Rocky Mountains uh, and only encountered one native band of Crow Indians on the return journey. However, my journey was not in vain. Uh, along the way, I witnessed many amazing geothermal features such as geysers, hot springs, and fumaroles, which looked like smoke pouring from the ground. I, of course, had never seen or even heard of a phenomenon so awe-inspiringly bizarre. The smell was horrendous, worse than a thousand rotten eggs. When I returned to Fort Raymond, I gave such vivid descriptions of this site that to this day it is named after me. The life of a mountain man is filled with awesome sights and experiences, but also great peril and tragedy. This land I was exploring was already occupied by many different tribes of people. Many were hospitable, but some were not. After witnessing this conflict up close and learning of the gruesome deaths of several companions, I decided it was time for me to return east. I bought a farm in Missouri, becoming a neighbor to Daniel Boone, and married a woman named Sally. My settled settle life was brief, and I died not from grizzlies or in conflict or by starvation, but from a short, unknown illness. My friend Thomas James wrote most of my stories. He described me as wearing an open, ingenious, and pleasing countenance of the Daniel Boone stamp. Nature had formed me, like Boone, for hearty endurance of fatigue, deprivation, and perils. My veracity was never questioned among them, and my character was that of a true American backwoodsman. Who am I? Yeah, uh, you. No. Um, yeah, you. Okay. Uh, you over there. Huh? John Clark? No. Oh, you? Yeah. No. Oh, yeah, you. No. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm John Coulter. A southern hero. How would you feel if your country went to war, but you got left out of it because you were a woman? The Civil War broke out between the North and the South because of strife over slavery. My family moved to the North, but my sympathy stayed with the South. Before the Civil War, I was an independent thinker, which led me to get involved in the war in an unusual way. My escapades are exciting and dangerous, and my final adventure is enthralling. My life before the Civil War is rich with stories that show you what kind of woman I am. I was born on August 10th, 1829, in Danville, Virginia, on an affluent cotton plantation. I was independent, strong-willed, and great at acting. My father strongly believed in the emancipation of slaves by their owners. This was an unusual opinion in those days. I grew up to be kind of unusual, too. On June 21st, 1848, I jilted Gen Lieutenant 
Amber Burnside at my wedding. When the minister asked me if I took this man as my husband, I said, no siree, Bobby, and quickly ran out of the church. The next year, I married Mr. Jim Clark on January 30th, 1849. Being copperheads, or northern supporters of the South, we used our home as a supplies base and a respite for the Confederate, soldiers, eh, Confederate States of America. Naturally, my sympathy was with the South because my three brothers had gone to fight in the Confederacy, and my sisters and mother helped in the Tennessee hospitals. My family was involved in the war now, but I still wanted to be part of it somehow. Our house became a network of spies for the Confederacy who would come through with messages for the South. One spy had a message he had to get to General Smith in Kentucky, but the Yankees were on to him. I took it instead. After that, I had many daring missions and lots of disguises. Sometimes I would be an old woman smuggling medicine to the South. Other times I'd be an Irish woman who'd been sent to clean the Union colonel's offices. And I did. I cleaned out his papers. I'd be English, threatening to tell my husband, Lord Overby, that Union forces delayed me on my way. And not wanting to cause an international incident, the troops would quickly pass me along. Once I posed as Lady Hall to Union Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton. I'd come from Britain to bathe in the warm waters of Virginia. Secretary Stanton let me ride in a carriage with him and Union President Abraham Lincoln. I pretended to be asleep while the two men became increasingly indiscreet about politics and war. I then passed safely unchecked to Confederate President Jefferson Davis and told him all the plans. Secretary Stanton and President Lincoln agreed that they had been outrageously duped. They placed a reward of $10,000 on my head, dead or alive. It was never collected. Because I greatly feared for the safety of my mother and my sister, Jimmy, I moved them to Memphis, Tennessee. Another way I supported the troops was to make dying soldiers happy by agreeing to marry them. Once I was engaged to 12 men at the same time. Then Jimmy, Jimmy beat me with 16 fiancés. All my adventures could not last forever. Disguised as an Irish washerwoman, I crossed the river into Kentucky. I pretended my son was injured in combat at Lexington. The Union private on Wash did not have the authority to let me through, but the general did. Imagine my dismay to find out the general was none other than Ambrose Burnside, my former fiancé. My Irish style act evaporated. Burnside recognized me. Instead of having me brutally hanged, he placed me under house arrest in the fashionable Burnett House in Cincinnati. He told me to stay away from espionage for the rest of the war. Reluctantly, I had to agree. After the war, my husband and I traveled to England, and I became the author of two popular novels. We stayed for the rest of our lives there. These stories from my life tell you what kind of woman I am. Although I moved to the north of the Childs, my sympathies have always been with the South. These strong feelings caused me to spy on the north for the South during the Civil War. While I managed to evade discovery for several years, I was eventually apprehended by none other than my former fiancé, General Ambrose Burnside. I got away from, with spying for so long because people did not perceive me as a threat since I was a woman. This made me more successful as a spy. Being a woman did not stop me from becoming a brave southern hero. Who am I? Caroline. Yes. I was born on August 13, 1860, as Phoebe Ann Moses in Drake County, Ohio. My father died of pneumonia when I was only five years old after getting caught in a snowstorm. I picked up my first rifle when I was seven years old with little to no training. I went to live in an in, in infirm, infirmary because my family was poor and couldn't afford to feed me and my six siblings. I calmly take in my first shooting ma match against the legendary sharp shooting shooter Frank Butler when I won a large amount of cash. I married Frank and traveled with him for five years until I joined the show as a sharpshooter. I was Nicknamed Little Sure Shot by Native Americans, Sitting Bull. 
I was brave, I was determined, I was brilliant. I faced an abundant abandon of obstacles from my childhood, but I did not let that stop me from living a fulfilling and perfect life. My most signature accomplishment was learning to shoot gun without much instruction from an adult and winning contests with this skill. Who am I? A fearless adventurer. When I go, I'd like best to go on my plane quickly. The 1920s to 1930s saw huge accomplishments and advancements with aviation. During this time, there were no air conditioning on planes, nor were, was there much heating. Also, there were uh, er, also there were no cycling systems such as air ducts on the planes, creating strong engine smells. Despite those inconveniences, there are many brave, determined, and adventurous men and women who loved being in the sky. I was one of those people. I was a summer baby born on July 24th, 1896 in Atchington, Kansas to Amy and Edwin. I remember my first, the first time I really saw an airplane. I was 10 years old at an Iowa State Fair in Des Moines. I remember thinking to myself that it was a thing of rusty wire and wood. It looked not at all interesting. How things have changed. 10 years later, I was spending all my spare money on flight lessons. Come here, spend my spare money on lessons and flight time. One day in 1926, I was selected on a three zealous woman flyers to make a transatlantic uh, at no pay, mind you. One cold spring morning, I le we left Boston Harbor and flew to Trapeze, Newfoundland, where on Ju June 17, 1928, we started across the Atlantic. After 20 hours and 40 minutes, Wilmer Stoltz, Lewis Gordon, and I standed in Buryport, Wales, and I successfully became the first female to fly across the Atlantic. After much publicity from my Atlantic flight, I spent time writing books, public speaking, flying races, and advertly breaking records. At some point, I, it occurred to me that I could be the first woman or first person to fly around the world. So after much preparation on Ju June 1st, 1937, I boarded my Lockheed Electra in Miami, Florida, along with my navigator, Fred Noonan. So far, we've ventured seven major countries. Our next stop is Howland Island and then Hawaii, then home. I should be back in time for July 4th celebration. I created and broke many world records throughout my stirring life as an adept pilot and as a woman. I was brave, fearless, determ determined, persistent, adventurous, and capable. Unfortunately, as I left New Guinea on July 2nd, 1937, this would be the last time anybody saw me alive. I was on July 3rd was the last communication heard somewhere over the Pacific Ocean. My plane and my body were never found, but I will always be remembered as a fearless adventurer. Who am I? You? Yes. yes. man on the moon. Have you ever wanted to travel to the moon? Well, I have. Um, 
First, I'll tell you about NASA. NASA is the group that made the trip possible. It stands for the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. Sending human beings to the moon was astoundingly uh, hard and very dangerous feat, but thankfully, NASA had the right people on board who could do it. On a late summer's night, August 5th, 1930, in the small town of Wapakoneta, uh, Ohio, was where I was born. As a young child, I loved planes and collected uh, model planes. Mainly, I would throw them and excitedly watch my models, cra uh, models crash and, watch and wonder why they didn't stay up. I was a Boy Scout and became an Eagle Scout earlier on. My first job was at a minuscule donut shop in a nearby village. Along with planes, I also loved music and was in a jazz band that was ca uh, called the Mississippi Moonshiners. Before I got my driver's license, I got my pilot's license. I joined the U.S. Uh, Navy during the Korean War and ventured on dangerous uh, bombing missions in enemy territory <clears throat> when I was in an action. I was a test pilot and tested the X-1, which was the first plane to break the Southern barrier. But my greatest accomplishment was I was the first man on the moon. That's one false, a small step for a man, but a giant leap for mankind. I famously quoted as I set foot on the moon's surface. I had two children, Rick and Muffy. Sadly, when she was two years old, Muffy fell and hit her head on the sidewalk. Her eyes became crossed, and me and my wife were worried, and we went to the doctor. It turned out that Muffy had a tumor deep in her brain. She lived through Christmas, but then tragically died in January uh, 1962. Sadly, few people ever knew this about the man on the moon, and some of his friends some of my friends never knew I even had a daughter. I died on August 25th, 2012, but still, no one forget this great man in America's history. So when you look up at the moon, don't forget me, the man on the moon. Who am I? Noah. Or you have to choose one. Yes. <laughs> big deals. I like thinking big. I always have. To me, it's very simple. If you're going to think big, or you know, if you want to think anyway, you might as well think big. Looking back on my life, I have accomplished a lot, and I have contributed a lot to the American people, as, as demonstrated by being acknowledged with the Ellis Award in 1986 for par persistence, tolerance, brotherhood, and diversity. I love the American people, and I love the work I do. I was born into a very wonderful family on June 14, uh, 1946, in Queens, New York. And my life was influenced greatly by my father, his real estate business, and the military boarding school I attended for five years. After gra graduating from the War Wharton School of Business, I joined my father's business, Trump Management. As much as I appreciate my father's business, I really wanted to be successful on my own. That's what I uh, en endeavored to do. I moved to Manhattan and worked hard, very hard. I, I never gave up. And you should, you, know, you can never give up if you want to be successful. After many stupendous business deals, Trump Tower became one of my favorite favorites. And er, I, I became a billionaire by the age of 42. 
I took my work ethic, resourcefulness, persistence, diligence, and preference, and applied this to other arenas. So far, I've written about 18 books. My first one, The Art of the Deal, being a bestseller. I owned casino. I own casinos, and a retail company. Own uh, prominent golf courses all over the world. Owned a pro professional football team. Had a major reality TV show called The Apprentice, for which I earned uh, a star on the Walk of Fame. When then went on to become the 45th president of the United States, which I am pr particularly proud of. I was one of one. The I was the one, the the only president to meet with North Korean leader Kim Jong Un. Finally, I ha helped or organize a peace deal with the Middle East known as the Abraham Accords. I love what I do. If you don't love what you do, you will never be su be successful. I love the I love real estate and making deals. It's my form of art. Some people make beautiful paintings or statues. I make deals, big deals. Who am I? I am unlike other faces gathered here today. There has been another like me before or after my time. I am the first and only. There was never, never, ever, never anything extraordinary about me from the beginning, except maybe my appetite. But one life event would propel me to achieving great feats no one ever expected me to accomplish. My life began in the racetracks of Seoul, Korea, 1949. My mother, Hachim He unfortunately died one week after I was born. Huck Moon, who first gave me the name Flame, became my caretaker. Though my legs were stout in size, I grew into a sturdy young adult. My adolescence was filled with turmoil, trepidation, causing my family to flee for, to, for safety for many years. When at last it was safe to return home, or so we thought, I settled into a life helping Huck Moon in the rice fields. I did not mind the work in the rice fields, but life seemed pretty mundane until it wasn't. While working in the fields one day, um, Huck Moon's sister, Chung Soon, stepped on a landmine, causing her serious bodily harm. Chung Soon would need a prosthetic leg, but her family of rice farmers could not raise enough to pay for the new leg. As God's timing would allow, U.S. Lieutenant Eric Penderson came to our stable one day with an offer Huck Moon could not resist. In that moment, and $250 later, my life as I had known it would be changed forever. Lieutenant Peterson introduced me to my new handlers, Private Monroe Coleman and Sergeant Joe Latham. These U.S. Marines were responsible for training me to carry the ammo for the recoils rifles, rifle known as the Reckless Rifle. These rifles were the key tool for the U.S. forces in war against North Korea. My short but sturdy legs and upper body strength were made for work like this. It seemed I had found my purpose working with these Marines, and I loved it. I especially loved the tasty treats they had at the training camp. Normally, a healthy diet wouldn't cons consist of Coca-Cola, scrambled eggs, bacon, chocolate, coffee, and the occasional poker chips, but the men didn't, could not resist my big eyes and hungry stomach. While training and having fun with the guys was enjoyable, the war was raging on, and I, we all had jobs to do. 
My time to shine came at the Battle of Vegas. March 26, 1953. I had seen battles before. Snow filled the air. Dirt was flying all around. The earth trembled under each step, and the tremendous ear-shattering blast cons constantly sounded from all sides. My senses could have been overloaded, but these intimidating distractions could not stop me from fulfilling my responsibilities. You see, what an average Marine could accomplish in 15 trips up and down the hill is in battle carrying ammunition for the reckless rifle. I completed in just five round trips. This strive to help my fellow Marines in battle was especially important at the Battle of Vegas. I would not give up, I could not give up. Though I was hit with sh shrapnel in the head and side, I continued to supply the men and the rifle with the ammunition. Before the battle, I completed 51 trips, traveled 35 miles up and down the rugged terrain while carrying over 9,000 pounds of ammo, as well as carrying wounded soldiers to safety through the battle. It helped that the men offered me bits of chocolate and sips of Coke on these trips and seeing their hopeful faces encouraged me through the battle. After two days, the U.S. Marines had regained control of Outpost Vegas. My job was finished for now, and I, I was exhausted, but proud to have served along these U.S. forces. Monday, July 27, 1953. At 10 a.m., the war in Korea ended with a truce between the Communist North and the Free South. Even though the war had ended, I still had a job to complete with my fellow Marines carrying communi um, communication wire through South Korea. For my dedication to the United States Marines and the people of South Korea, I was promoted sergeant and received two Purple Hearts for the wounds I received in battle, as well as many other accolades. However, because I was Korean native, the U.S. government would not pay for my passing to come to America. After some campaigning, my fellow Marines were able to find a gracious ship owner who agreed to pay my passage to California. Upon my arrival, I was stationed at Camp Pendleton in California. I retired November 10, 1960 as Staff Sergeant with full military honors. Retire life allowed me to enjoy my offspring, fearless, dauntless, and chesty. Unfortunately, I developed painful dil debilitating arthritis in my back, probably from all the tremendous fight I carried in the war. I breathed my last breath on May 13th, 1968, at age 20. On July 26, 2013, a life statue was dedicated in my honor at the National Museum of Moraine Corps in Virginia. From the rice fields in Korea to the rolling hills of green in America, my short but full life consisted of dedication and service to those I loved. My short but secure legs carried me safely through the Korean War, and my healthy appetite gave me energy to persevere through the battles. I may have been a fierce flame through the, dur through the battles during the war, but I was anything but reckless. Who am I? Yes. Yes. At a young age, I became an inventor. I made a go-kart out of junkyard scraps, and I made an engine for it. Creatively, I invented a toy for kids called the Super Soaker. After making the water gun, I had to be persistent in finding someone to buy my idea. Also, I made a Nerf gun that worked on air pressure I made foam darts for the Nerf, Nerf gun. In 1968, I won first place in the science fair held at the University of Alabama. My robot stood, stood three and a half feet tall. I called him Lonex, and it won first prize. I was inspired to make my robot after watching the television show called Lost in Space. Lonex worked by remote control. 
Compressed air cylinders and valves allowed his arms to move. Second, I am brave. Fearlessly, I made a rocket and was a chef in the kitchen when it came to making rocket fuel. I was adept and efficient with my homemade rocket fuel recipe. But one time it exploded and caused a fire in my kitchen. My parents didn't get mad. Oddly, they bought me a hot plate and lovingly told me to do my experiments outside. <laughs> Finally, when I got my recipe right, I used it to launch a small rocket for a school project. I was born on October 6, 1949, so I grew up in the segregated South in Mobile, Alabama. They had separated bathrooms and water fountains. Being black, I had to use the ones that said colored. I would get in trouble if I used the white ones. Lastly, I had a lot of adventures and surprises in my life. Surprisingly, Alabama University didn't ask me to attend after winning their science fair. Instead, I got a scholarship and went to Tuskegee University in Alabama. In 1979, thrillingly, I started at NASA. Once after taking a test, someone told me I could only be a technician, but I flourished as an engineer. I have 133 patents. I am the... Alabama, in the Alabama Engineering Hall of Fame. When I was a child, my parents squeezed six small children into our small house. I'm the third of six children. Who am I? Dr. Lonnie Johnson. Only those who will risk going too far can possibly find out how far it is possible to go. T.S. Eliot. I was born on May 26, 1951 in Los Angeles, California. By the time I was five, I learned to read and love sports as a young girl, including baseball. When I was a teenager, my dad wanted me to play a sport that was less dangerous and suggested tennis. I fell in love with the sport. I was trained by Alice Marble, one of the most adept tennis coaches in California and the number one ranking in the world. Tim tennis opened doors for me, including a scholarship to a private all-girls high school. I excelled in math and science and was accepted into Swarthmore College in Pennsylvania, later transferring to Stanford University as a physics major. I never could have imagined what an impact I would have for future generations. At the end of finishing my PhD in 1977, I audaciously answered an advertisement in my school newspaper from NASA. They were looking for young astronauts. I knew this is what I wanted to do in my life. I was hired for the job and began intense training. I met my husband, who was another astronaut, and we married on July 26, 1982. I even flew my own plane to the wedding. I spent five years training to become an astronaut before I was ready to launch. On June 18, 1983, I became the first American woman in space on a shuttle called Challenger. During liftoff, I was the flight engineer. We had a successful mission, and, we land and when we landed on Earth, I, I realized everyone wanted to talk to NASA's first woman. After my time at NASA, I wanted to share my love of science and math with young girls, so I created a program called KidSat. 
which gave middle school students a chance to be a part of shuttle missions. I also wrote books, taught students, and won many honored awards. My legacy was creating programs that would help girls excel in science and math. I was quoted saying, I would like to remember as someone who was not afraid to do what she wanted to do, and as someone who took risks, risks along the way, along the way in order to achieve her goals. I died in 2011, no, 2012 of cancer at 61 years old. I hope girls will be inspired by my love of space and see what hard work Work and persistence can achieve. Achieve. Who am I? Um. Caroline. Yes. Good job, guys. You guys chose some really colorful characters and did a great job presenting those. We're going to take a, um, an intermission now, and Miss Jill's class will present after the intermission. So how about 10 minutes? Be back at uh, 625.
little closer. Like shorten it a little bit? Yep. That might be a little. I'm probably about the size of most of the kids, right? <laughs> that has it. Like really close. Hello. Okay, who's next? I don't know. Um, okay, so this will go. Oh, that top, that's actually probably easier. Hello. Well, Jill's class, please come and find your seat.
Hello. If you guys could find your seats, we're going to resume with Jill Ellis's class. Jill? Just like Miss Carla's class, we're just so, so proud of all of these kids and all the hard work that they've done, and they've just done so much. Um, just a little bit of a change on your program. Nathaniel Lohman is on the first side, and he's actually going with my class. He's part of my class. So he's third, third to last. So just so you know, Nathaniel Lohman, he'll be in this group, okay? Um, we're just going to have Noah go first because we're waiting on, on a morse. So... Um, Noah, do you want to start us off? Okay. <laughs> A Christian leader. I once said the greatest lessons in life are, are often taught through hardship and adversity. Born on January 19th, 1807, I lost my father when I... I lost my father when I was only 11 years old and my mother when I was 22. It was during my adulthood that I faced the most soul-wrenching event in my life, a war. Throughout the frightful time, I learned the most important lesson in my life, to fully trust in the Almighty God no matter the circumstances. The beginning of this war was in the year of 1861. I was deeply worried. During the Mexican War, I experienced the immense destruction a war could cause and therefore knew the dissolution of the uni Union would, a, would bring a great calamity to our country. President Abraham Lincoln offered me to take command of the Union and wage war against the South. As I saw Virginia, my loving home state, secede from the Union, I was forced to make the hardest decision of my life. I cannot fathom to draw a sword against my own family, relatives, and friends, so I boldly refused that offer and eventually became the general of the Confederate States. The years that followed the Civil War were marked by death, sickness, and complete devastation. I can testify that it was my faith, which started with my mother, that held me through those extremely hard years. The Bible was precious to me, and we would take time to pray and worship with the soldiers even before imminent attacks. We had victories, but also disheartening casualties. The Battle of Gettysburg brought massive loss to our army, and after and after repenting and fasting before God, we experienced an extensive revival in our camps where thousands came to faith in Christ. In 1865, after overwhelming losses and without supplies, we painfully realized that we could not win against the Union, and I decided to meet General Ulysses S. Grant at Appomattox Courthouse in Virginia to surrender and end this war. I mainly recognized for my leadership as a general in the Civil War and fighting for my home state. However, what I hold dear to me is not my achievements, my medals, or fame, but my faith in the living God, which sustained me in, during the hardest years of my life. Who am I? Um, yes. Greater love, war, it brought choices, it brought sacrifices. Shortly after I immigrated to the colonies, the grumblings of the American Revolution began. I had difficult choices to make about my loyalties to my family, my faith, and my new country. My early life was full of both joys and sorrows. In 1729, I was born in Dublin, Ireland. My family were Quakers. We didn't believe in war. We were not ornate. In 1753, at the age of 24, I met and married a man named William. William also came from a Quaker family. His father was a clergyman of a small church in Ireland. Shortly after our marriage, we made the decision to move to America, which meant that now I would have to leave my family. 
However, once we were settled in America, things began to look up as I began to work as a nurse and a midwife with considerable proficiency and success. William and I had nine children. Unfortunately, four did not make us past infancy. Although my early life was filled with many hardships and sorrows, we were now settled in America. I was the first American female spy. During the British occupation of Philadelphia in 1777, General William Howe stationed his headquarters across the street from my family's home. As we were fairly opulent, General Howe often demanded the use of one of our upstairs rooms for private meetings. Because we were Quakers, the British spoke freely around us, especially when we were serving them refreshments. The British, however, were not aware that my family secretly supported the scrappy Americans. This made it easy to grab bits of information and send them directly to General Washington. We had a strategy for doing this. Intently, I would listen for, for troop movements and supply shipments. Afterwards, I would report to my husband what I had heard, and he would write the message in code. Then he would give it back to me, and I would fit it over a button, sew fabric over it, and attach it to my younger son's coat. Then I would send him to visit his brother, who was a lieutenant stationed in White, Mar White Marsh with General Washington's army. My oldest son, Charles, would then rip apart the button, take out the message, decode it, and inform General Washington of all the things that we had heard. Thus, I became a spy. On December 2nd, 77, 1777, the British asked for an upstairs room in which to hold a meeting. Uncommonly, they asked for us to retire to bed and not disturb them under any cir circumstances. After I let the officers in, I headed to bed, but I couldn't sleep. Eventually, I crept to the door and listened at the keyhole. Surprisingly, I heard that the troops were to attack White Marsh on December 4th, which was only two days away. As I hurried back to bed with my heart pounding, I wondered how I could warn General Washington with such short notice. The next morning, I asked General Howe for a pass to leave the city to buy flour at the mill. With permission granted, I headed to the mill outside of town. Fortunately, on the way, I encountered my son's friend and was able to warn him of the upcoming attack. When the British arrived at White Marsh the next day, expecting to triumph easily over the unsuspecting Americans, they failed and returned to Philadelphia in defeat. Although it was annoying for the British to intrude on our home, I was thankful that I was able to assist my country in some way because of it. The sorrows of my early life were difficult to bear, but they helped shape me into a courageous woman and a loyal patriot. Without my quick action, General Washington's army would have been completely decimated by the surprise attack from the British. As the Bible says in John 15, 13, greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. Who am I? Uh, yes. No. I am Lydia Darrow. Boom, a bullet whizzed past me. Nevertheless, I was unharmed because I had God's protection over me. It was my life goal to help and serve others. Therefore, even on the battlefield with dangers all around me, I decided to assist those who were fighting and try to save the lives of the injured. Even as a small child, I would stand up for what was right and defend the weak, despite my timid personality. It was because I had a deep passion for helping people during the war and beyond. I was, in North, uh, I was born in North Oxford, Massachusetts on Christmas Day, 1821. I grew up hearing epic stories of battles fought by Captain Stephen, who was, my, who was my father. He had been enlisted by the army, although he never hold, held the position of captain. He enjoyed going by that title. Meanwhile, my mother tended to be rigid with little patience for fun. She cared for the house and the children, but at times she seemed cold and uncaring. 
My much older sisters, Dolly and Sally, taught me to read and write poems at the young age of three, since they both had been teachers. My brother, Stephen, taught me mathematics, while my other brother, David, taught me how to ride in a horse and, enjoy the out and to enjoy the outdoors. Sadly, my mother, Sarah, did not educate me in any way. When I was 10, David fell off the roof of our barn and soon after got very sick. I tended to David while he was sick, and this helped prepare me for my life's work of nursing. At the age of 17, well, at the age of 17, my mother, concerned about my shy personality, took me to a phrenologist, a doctor who examines the, bump, the bumps on my skull to predict personality traits. According to this doctor, the bumps on my head indicated that I needed to become a teacher to overcome my lack of confidence. My whole life, I had been, I had been shy and a bit of a tomboy, and this would continue to be my propensity. I always had a heart for helping people. Consequently, one year after my appointment with a phrenologist, I found myself in a one-room school in North Oxford with 40 students. The only strange thing was that I was the teacher. The oldest of the students were as tall or taller and almost as old as I was. Once when I was teaching, a 15-year-old boy tested my authority, and so I whipped him so hard that he fell to the ground. I was so shaken that I dismissed all the students for recess. When I rang the bell for classes to resume, the boy apologetically returned with flowers. We became friends by the end of the day. News spread quickly that I was able to control my classroom. In 1840, I was offered a year-round position in a school, but only, but for only a summer's wages, which was $2 a week. The pay was lower because I was a woman. I was willing to take the position on the condition that I would be paid equal wages to a man. To my surprise, the school board agreed. Some years later, I was living in New Jersey, and I saw some boys just standing on the street corner. I asked them why they weren't in school, and they replied that their families couldn't afford to send them to school. Deeply moved by that experience, I established the first free school in New Jersey in 1852. The first day, I had 68 students, but by the end of the year, there were 600 young minds hungry to learn. In 1854, the southern states declared their secession from the Union over the horrible issue of slavery. As a result, the Civil War commenced. I knew it was time for me to serve in a different capacity. I began gathering food, water, and supplies for the soldiers and also began nursing soldiers that had been injured in battle. One of the most gruesome battles was at Bull Run. That day, 3,000 men died. Some of the soldiers that I, ha that I took care of were former students of mine. This mission of nursing injured soldiers back to health earned me the title of the Angel of the Battlefield. The Civil War came to an end in 1865, but my greatest accomplishment was yet to come. In the time following the war, I spent time writing letters to the families of soldiers that had died to give them comfort and closure for their lost loved one. But I did not have a true ha mission. A friend of mine suggested the opportunity of lectures sharing with people across the country about my experiences during the war. After months of speaking and becoming very popular, my doctor recommended that I take some time off to rest and travel to Europe, where I was not well known. During my time in Europe, I became acquainted with the International Red Cross. When war broke out in Europe in 1870, I decided to join the Red Cross, committing to aid the soldiers in any way I could. Once when a German soldier discovered that I was not German, he held a sword to my chest, threatening to kill me. Unwaveringly, I glared back at him until he retreated, overpowered by my gaze. At the end of the war, I was honored for my service with a jeweled red cross on a necklace from the Queen of Serbia. In 1873, I petitioned the American government about establishing the, Amer the Red Cross in the United States. Initially, the government rejected my idea. But after some persuading, they agreed to the inauguration of the American Red Cross. Although I served well during the Civil War, I am most renowned for the accomplishment of founding the American Red Cross, which continues to help people today. I was a timid, I was a timid child with very little formal education, but with God's help, I accomplished great things. 
He put a passion in my heart for helping people, which began with helping my brother David recover from his illness and teaching school for many years, helping injured soldiers in America and Europe, but most of all, in my greatest accomplishment of founding the American Red Cross. Who am I? I am Claire Barton. A writer of influence. Benjamin Franklin once said, either write something worth reading or do something worth writing. This idea became a great goal of my life. Even as the Civil War raged and families were cruelly divided, I pursued my love of writing. Sadly, times were hard. While men fought at the front, women were trying to raise children and insist the war effort in any way they could. Growing up in the 1830s, my life abounded in family affection, but was also overflowing with financial woes, which weighed heavily on my mother. To combat these money troubles, I performed various jobs to help my family. Nevertheless, I managed to write many novels, including a renowned classic about four sisters. My childhood, while difficult in some ways, encouraged a love of learning and literature. In Germantown, Pennsylvania in 1832, I was born the second oldest of four daughters. My parents were part of the Transcendentalist Movement, which was a popular religious movement, and my father was often more absorbed with philosophy than making a living. Still, my father persuaded me to journal my thoughts, believe that children should enjoy learning, and had an important role in my early education. While my family struggled financially always, had lots of debts, and moved often, we were fortunate to know writers Henry David Thoreau and Ralph Waldo Emerson. When we moved into a house near the Emersons, I was allowed to use his magnificent library. This sparked my imagination. Additionally, additionally I often stayed to plays with my sisters, who were my closest friends. Thus, my early years were a formative part of my creativity and writing. Because of my family's financial hardship, I worked a number of jobs to provide necessary income for my family. When I turned 15, I taught Ralph Waldo Emerson's children. Even though I preferred writing, I also washed laundry, sewed, and acted as a governess. In 1850, at age 18, I actually sold my first writing and later wrote a book called Flower Fables, which sold 1,600 copies. During the Civil War, I worked at the Union Hospital for two weeks, but contracted typhoid fever and had to return home. Quietly, I wrote a book called Hospital Sketches about my time as a Civil War nurse. This recovery time proved significant. While I did several jobs for income, I still managed to pursue my love of writing. While hospitals... While Hospital Sketches was popular when it was published in 1863, my fame was cemented with a publication that was based on my early life. In 1867, my publisher asked me to write a book for girls. I based this book on my own family. I wrote about the four March girls who were much like my sisters and myself, and the mother in the book was similar to my own mother, who I called Marnie. Diligently, I wrote Little Women, an instant bestseller in only three months. I went on to write three more books, which were all part of the series. Little Women, which was even more popular than Hospital Sketches, is still widely read today. I will, be, I will forever be remembered for a book which was a reflection of my personal story. Even though I was hindered by some Early hardships, I soaked up stories and began to write stories of my own. While money troubles caused me to seek employment in many different ways, I still managed to put pen to paper. I follow my passion. Finally, the publication of Little Women planted me firmly into fame. 
Writing about my ordinary childhood, I became a famous author, and now, over 150 years later, people are still reading my works. Who am I? Stories of long ago, the real things haven't changed. It is still best to be honest and truthful, to make the most of what we have, to be happy with simple pleasures and have courage when things go wrong. In 1862, the Homesteading Act offered 160 acres of free land on the prairies. Settlers who wanted to gain possession of the land had to build a house, dig a well, and plant crops. Bumping along in covered wagons, hundreds of thousands of people ventured west. Eventually, the frontier vanished. I grew up as a pioneer girl, married, had a family, and faithfully endured hardships. When I was grown, I became one of the world's best-loved authors. Growing up as a pioneer girl was exciting and eventful. I was born February 7th, 1867 in a log cabin in the wild woods of Wisconsin. I was so small that my pa called me a half pint of cider, half drunk up. When I was two years old, my family, ma, pa, my older sister Mary and I, packed our belongings into a covered wagon and bounced along the dusty rutted roads across the open prairie to Kansas. After sitting around a roaring fire each night, Mary and I climbed into bed in the covered wagon while, we pe while Pa peacefully played his fiddle. My sister Carrie was born in Kansas. Then we traveled to the grasslands of Minnesota where we lived in a sod house, which was built into the side of the prairie. One day, our ox stumbled over the roof of our dugout. All of the sudden, the ox's hoof shot through the ceiling of the house. After we moved to Iowa, my sister Grace was born. Suddenly, tragedy struck. My sister Mary became deathly ill with brain fever. Although she survived, she was left blind. Paul explained to me that I would have to be Mary's eyes by describing the world around us. Growing up as a pioneer girl, I didn't realize, but someday my ability to observe details and bring them to life in words would help me become a writer. Farming on the prairie was difficult. In the year 1886, I was happily married and had a little family. In October of 1880, one of the worst win winters blew in with blinding blizzards every few days. Snowdrifts blocked the trains. The town was running out of food, and we were beginning to starve. Bravely, Almanza Wilder and his friend ventured across the prairie in a sled to find a homesteader who had wheat. Despite the danger, they risked their lives to save the townspeople. Five years later, Almanzo proposed to me, and we were married on August 25th, 1886. I had a baby girl named Rose. After Rose was born, we had a baby boy who died in my arms when he was only a few days old. Then our house burned down because the stove caught fire. Soon the hail destroyed the wheat crops and a drought came. Packing up our covered wagon, we waved goodbye to our family and friends and traveled to the Missouri Ozarks. We bought a 40-acre farm. which we called Rocky Ridge. Although we had many hardships, we endured. When we were farming, I began to write for a newspaper. My first article was about raising chickens. My daughter, Rose, who was an author, asked me to write down my memories. Remembering my stories, I exclaimed, to my surprise, I have discovered that I have led a very interesting life. My first book, published in 1932. It, it was called The Little House in the Big Woods. Sk 
Skillfully, I wrote seven more books about my life. I received lots of lovely letters from my readers around the world because they love my stories. In 1957, on February 10th, I died at Rocky Ridge Farm three days after my 90th birthday. I am remembered as one of the world's greatest loved authors. I grew up as a pioneer girl, married, had a family, and endured hardships. Incredibly, I persevered. Across the world, readers continue to me remember me as one of their favorite authors because I wrote interesting stories about my life. People who read my wonderfully written books learn about life on the prairie. Looking back on my life, I wrote these words. As you read my stories of long ago, I hope you will remember that things truly worthwhile and that will give you happiness are the same now as they were then. It is not the things you have that make you happy. It is love and kindness and helping each other and just plain being good. Who am I? Claire. Yes. Light in the darkness. Quote, I know that the education of this child will be the distinguishing event of my life if I have the brains and perseverance to accomplish it. Although I suffered with major physical disabilities, I overcame them to become a renowned teacher of a most difficult girl. Sadly, I suffered a traumatizing childhood overflowing with innumerable obstacles. I unlocked a world of words for my student. In my later years, I traveled extensively and even appeared in a small film. Would history remember me? I was born on April 14th, 1866 in Western Massachusetts. My father was a very heavy alcoholic with an explosive temper. Mother, on the other hand, was gentle and would hide me from father whenever she was able. When I was five years old, my eyes started bothering me. The doctors diagnosed this as a painful, contagious eye disease, trachoma. Just after this, my mother passed away from the heavy effects of tuberculosis. Before my eighth birthday, my father abandoned me and my younger brother, Jimmy. Unfortunately, we were sent to the Alma House in Tewksbury, Massachusetts. Quote, I longed desperately to die. I believe very few children have ever been so completely left alone as I was. End quote. When I was 14 years old, I received a chance to go to school, Perkins Institute for the Blind and Deaf. On June 1st, 1886, I graduated as valedictorian at the age of 20. The question now was money. One morning, I found a note on my desk detailing a tutoring position for a little blind, deaf, and mute girl. Would I be able to teach this child? After a few months of preparation, I began a 1,000-mile quest by train. Nervous and weary, I disembarked in Alabama on March 3, 1887. Understandably, my first question was, where is the child? Later, as the little girl was helping me unpack, she discovered a doll in my bag. I grabbed the child's hand and spelled D-O-L-L -L using the manual alphabet. When she did not respond, I forcefully removed the doll from her hands. I realized my mistake too late. My little tornado-like child threw a temper tantrum. Our first dinner was disastrous. I lost two teeth. Realizing that I could not teach my student with her parents' interference, I decided that we needed to live alone. We took a lengthy serpentine drive so she would not recognize our location. On April 15, 1887, a miracle happened. The uncontrollable child, whom I had fought with so many times, transformed into a gentle little girl. I had won her trust. From that moment on, we made rapid progress. After spending a whole day fingerspelling words into her hand, my eager student added more than 300 words to her vocabulary. We had come a long way. What seemed impossible had become possible. My pupil graduated in 1913 with her diploma, which opened up many possibilities for her. I was awarded the Teacher's Medal in 1915 because I taught adroitly and patiently. Surprisingly, I traveled to dazzling Hollywood in 1917 to star in Deliverance, a short film about my teaching experiences. On October 20th, 1936, at the ripe age of 70, I passed away. My ashes were buried at the National Cemetery in Washington, D.C. 
I was the first woman and the first teacher to be honored so highly. I had freed my student from a vast crater of darkness and silence. I overcame a childhood full of pain and hardships. I was awarded a prestigious teacher's medal. In my later life, I explored the world through travel. I made a path of light through a dark world. Who am I? Yes. Hope and struggle. Once I knew only darkness and stillness. My life was without past or future. But a little word from the fingers of another fell into my hand that clutched at emptiness, and my heart leaped to the rapture of living. In 1880, the Civil War had ended. My father, who fought for the Confederacy, had returned to his home, Ivy Green, which was where I was born. The first part of my life was happy and cheerful, but sadly, sickness left me feeling alone in a silent, dark world. I struggled because I had no way to communicate. Fortunately, with the help of my amazing teacher, I overcame, learned, and became famous. My early life was full of difficulty, and I needed help to overcome. I was born on June 27, 1880, in Tuscumbia, Alabama. Looking back on my life, I wrote, the beginning of my life was simple, and much like every other little life. I came, I saw, I conquered, as the first baby in the family always does. When I was 19 months old, I became seriously ill with scarlet fever and nearly died. Miraculously, I survived, but the sickness left me blind, deaf, and mute. Because my parents felt sorry for me, they did not discipline me. Consequently, I was angry and out of control. One day, when I was five, I became so enraged that I recklessly dumped my baby sister, Mildred, out of her cradle. Thankfully, my mother caught her just in time. My parents were desperate to find help. I needed a teacher to unlock my mind, give me language and communication, and set me free from frustration and anger. So when I was six years old, Dr. Alexander Graham Bell wisely advised my parents to ask Perkins Institute for a teacher. On March 3rd, 1887, my teacher, 20-year-old Annie Sullivan, arrived. Annie signed words into my hands, letter by letter, at every opportunity, using the American Sign Language alphabet. I did not understand, and Annie faced a nearly impossible task. One day at the sink, while the water was flowing over my hand, Annie spelled W-A-T-E-R several times. I copied her, but did not know what it meant. I was confused. But Annie had a brilliant idea. She immediately brought me outside to the water pump right outside the beautiful house and pumped the water. Then, while it was rushing delightfully over my hands, she spelled W-A-T-E-R earnestly over and over again to me. Suddenly, my eyes lit up and I spelled it back. I finally understood. She had unlocked my mind. I, later I quoted, the mystery of language was revealed to me. I knew then that W-A-T-E-R meant the wonderful, cool something that was flowing over my hand. That living word awakened my soul, gave it light, hope, and joy, and set it free. I finally understood that everything had a name. My teacher, Annie Sullivan, truly transformed my life. I was determined not to be held back by my inabilities, but learned many things and became famous. I, uh, sorry. My parents and I learned the American Sign Language alphabet. We can finally communicate. I quickly learned Braille and proved that people who cannot see and hear are still smart. I met President Grover Cleveland, who was amazed by what I had accomplished. In the spring, uh, of 1890, when I was 10, I learned about a girl in Norway who was also deaf and blind. Amazingly, she had learned to speak. I excitedly took the challenge. Not wanting to stand in my way, my teacher hired a tutor. Incredibly, I learned to speak. Later in my life, I spoke these famous words. Character cannot be developed in ease and quiet. 
Only through the experience of trial and suffering can the soul be strengthened, ambition inspired, and success achieved. After studying at Perkins Institute for a little while, I attended two other schools and graduated from Radcliffe College in 1904. Soon after, I wrote my first book, The Story of My Life. I studied hard and became famous, inspiring people and impacting many lives. I died on June 1st, 1968. However, the story of my life lives on. I was not sorry for myself because I cannot see and hear, but thank God for what I could do. My teacher helped me make the most of the life God had given me. I learned many things and became famous. I left a long lasting legacy. My story continues to give people hope in the midst of their struggles. Who am I? You, over in the back. Mm -hmm. I'm Helen Keller. Uh, yeah, so. The Lord's calling. Lord, I want to be your girl. If ever I can do anything for you, just let me know and I'll do it. Little did I know that this simple prayer would lead to an overwhelming blessing of God's kindness poured out over my life. I was born in 1887 in Florida. At some point, my family moved to Georgia where we made sweet connections with friends in the Assembly of God Church and I met my best friend, Jesus. As a blue-eyed, six-foot-tall young woman, I had my life all mapped out. I was going to work for a newspaper as a sketch artist and wear fancy clothes with pretty shoes. But God had other plans. On a train ride to my first big interview, I sat next to a woman named Maddie Perry, who offered me a job at an orphanage in North Carolina. To my utter amazement, God closed the door on what I wanted to do with the newspaper and opened the door for what I never thought I would do the cooking, mending, and general care for 100 children at the Faith Orphanage with Maddie. As my love for the children and all their unique personalities grew, so did my desire to serve God. After attending a church service one night where a missionary spoke, I soon knew that this was the next step for me. I was again willing to trust God's plan rather than my own. After a few miracles in a short amount of time, my church friends sent me off as a missionary on a ship, on a ship with this verse from Exodus 3, 7. I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cries. My ship's destination was a suit Egypt. On November 10th, 1910, my exciting adventure began. I arrived in Egypt, but not alone. Thankfully, God provided the company of my, the company of my sister Jenny, who made the trip with me. We had a free place to stay with a missionary from the United States. Not long after we arrived, intense banging awakened us one night when a man from a nearby village urged us to follow him. We sensed God's leading, so we followed him. Walking into a dark hut, we saw a dying woman holding a small bundle in her arms. We were shocked that the bundle was a starving tiny baby. We were told that the baby was a girl and would be thrown into the Nile once the mother died. The man we followed wanted us to take the baby, and without hesitation, we did. Unfortunately, the missionary we were staying with was not pleased with the decision, so we had to find a new place to live. God provided the money to rent a small room for the baby, Jenny, and myself. Within a few days, another knock came to our door, and two hungry-looking boys appeared needing a home. I knew then that God was calling me to step out in faith, trust him to provide, and prepare to start an orphanage. Running an orphanage would require, would require extraordinary commitment, but I knew this was my calling. Before long, there were eight children under my care in a small rented room. With the little money we had, I purchased a donkey so I could ride to farms where grain was freely given to feed the children in my care. God provided again and again with blessings of food and medical care for the children. When a piece of land went up for sale, I knew God wanted me to buy it to lay a foundation for an orphanage. With no money, I had to trust God to provide the funds. Again and again, he provided all of our needs. We never had enough food for the next day, but God always came through. We planted a garden and made our own bricks out of mud for the orphanage to be built. I taught the children Bible, English, and Arabic. 
It was during this time that my sister Jenny went back to the United States. She had been such a gift from God during my transition to Egypt. Continuing to be faithful to my calling, more orphans and even some widows came to the orphanage. At the start of World War I, I kept saying, show me the way, Lord, and he always did. At one point, I had 107 orphans and widows. The Lord protected us from gunfire by sheltering us in an old kiln. When our orphanage needed to expand, the children again helped make the mud bricks. When we needed food, blankets, and clothing, truckloads came. God always sent help our way, and we learned to live each day by faith in his care. By 1933, I had 700 orphans, 25 cows, a hospital, and a church inside of the orphanage. I died in 1961 at the age of 74. When asked what the secret to my success was, my response was, I stayed with the work God gave me to do and did not quit. My life was one of exciting adventure, extraordinary commitment, and faithfulness to my Lord and his calling. Who am I? Uh, Jesslyn? No. Hannah? Yes. The great American legend. A famous <laughs> athlete once said, heroes get remembered, but legends never die. As the oldest of eight children, I was born into a poor Baltimore family. On February 18th, 95. Oh, I meant 1895. Since my, oh, I'm sorry, this is 1895. Since my parents worked long hours, I spent much of my time skipping school, making trouble, and playing baseball on the streets. I created so much trouble for my parents that in 1902, at the age of seven, my parents sent me to St. Mary's School for boys, which was a poor boarding school for orphans and troublemakers like me. At first, the only thing I liked about school was the food, but it turned out that it was probably the best thing that ever happened to me. My teacher, Brother Matthias, took an interest in my baseball abilities and began to mentor me. Under his guidance, I flourished. By the time I was eight, I was playing baseball with the 12-year-olds. One day, as I was playing umpire, I began to mock the pitcher. Brother Matthias said, if you think pitching is so easy, you try it. So I did. I was a natural. In, in 1914, after playing baseball at the school for almost 12 years, Jack Dunn from the Baltimore Orioles came to visit the school. He offered me a job as a pitcher, earning $600 per year. I took it right away. Getting paid money to play baseball was awesome. On April 22, 1914, I pitched my, pitched my first game, and we won 6 to nothing, leading the Orioles to the top 13 game winning streak. I became known as the top major league, minor league rookie. My persistent hard work was paying off. In July of 1914, I was traded to the Boston Red Sox, which was a major league team where I was a, where I was the pitcher and a batter. I slammed my first home run out of the ball field in May of 1915. That same year, I pitched 29 scoreless innings which broke the World Series record of 42 years. In 1919, I became famous after hitting my first Grand Slam. I was traded to the New York Yankees in 1920. Baseball was becoming a big deal in America because of me. In my first season with the Yankees, I scored 54 home runs, breaking the previous record by 39. In 1921, I broke my own record again, scoring 59 home runs that year. People would climb trees and telephone poles just, just to see me play. I became unstoppable. On opening day of 1924, with a crowd of 74,000 people watching, I hit, I hit a home run at the grand opening of the New York Yankees Stadium. America, America was on the great... Uh, was. 
on the brink of the Great Depression, and I was raking in a shocking $80,000 per year. In 1927, I set the last record I was ever set, and I hit 60 home runs that year. When I turned 35, I began to slow down, and in 1953, I retired from baseball altogether. Over the course of my 22 season career, I hit a whopping 714 home runs. In 1936, I, I was inducted into the Hall of Fame for my home run record in my left hand pitching. At the time of economic hardship in America, I was a beacon of hope to many. I gave them something to look forward to, baseball and another home run. On September 16, 1948, at the young age of 53, I died after a long battle with throat cancer. Only two batters ever broke my lifelong record. I became known as the great American baseball legend. Who am I? Uh, Trish Kate? Yeah, but what's my real name? That's just my nickname. Um, my real name is George Herman Ruth. I can't read from this far away. There. That's better. Yeah. The man with a dream. I live by a quote, keep moving forward. I love to dream and do the impossible. My dreams began as a child. I was born December 5th, 1901. When I was seven years old, I went to school for the first time with my younger sister, which I thought was the most embarrassing thing ever. There were presentations at my school, and for one of mine, I tied a rope around a mouse, <coughs> and I walked it around the schoolroom. Yes, I did get in trouble for this creative idea. Because my main goal in school was to make my classmates laugh, my teacher called me the second dumbest kid in her class. I had a big imagination and did not enjoy basic drawings. So when, I, so when my teacher asked the class to draw flowers, I drew them with arms and legs. Another time for my school presentation, I dressed up as my favorite president, Abraham Lincoln. I quoted the Gettysburg Address and uh, yeah, I had a cottonwood tree in my backyard where I would draw and dream. I called this tree the dreaming tree. As I grew up, this mic is in the way. As I grew up, I went through many hard situations. These rough times made me realize the need for joy in lives. Trains were. Whatever. Trains were something that brought me great. <laughs> Trains were something that brought me great joy. I built a steam power train in my backyard. It was one and a half miles long. My love for drawing continued as I grew up. I started a studio called Lapogram Studio. Tragically, it shut down because we ran out of money. This did not stop me from pursuing my dreams. I still went through many hardships. One of them was a nervous breakdown. However, I continued to live out my dreams and I kept moving forward. <coughs> Wait, I think I forgot to do the beginning. Oh. I aspire to make a full length film, um, Snow White. Wait, no, I just skipped stuff. I aspired to make a full-length film. Many people around me said that this was a crazy feat. 
No one would want to sit that long and watch it. I ignored the naysayers, sayers, and the and my first film, Snow White, won an Oscar. Actually, it won one large Oscar and seven small ones. Uh, where was it? Oh, it was a joyous occasion and only the start of my big dreams. Clubs were started all over the country in honor of my favorite character. In, in honor of my favorite character that launched all the magic, these clubs were called the Mickey Mouse Clubs. My dreams and accomplishments told the story of my life because, oh wait, I just skipped it, period. Because my mom passed away, <laughs> because my mom passed away, you will notice that a lot of main characters in my films do not have moms. My biggest dream started one day at the park. It was on a Saturday, which we lovingly called Daddy's Day. <clears throat> I was sitting on a bench watching my two daughters on the merry-go-round. I thought how wonderful it would be to have a place where families could have fun together from the parents, from the parents all the way down to the youngest child. My wife said amusement. <laughs> My wife said amusement parks were gross and dangerous, but I confidently assured her that mine would be different. My dream became a reality on July 17, 1955. I stood at the entrance to Disneyland and announced, to all who come to this happy place, welcome. My failures did not crush my life. I turned my dreams into reality. The face of many hurdles I love to inspire others to keep moving forward. My name is. No, you're supposed to all say it, not raise your hand. You're supposed to all say it. I think half of you got it right. I have one message that Jesus Christ came, he died on a cross, he rose again, and he asked us to repent of our sins and receive him by faith as Lord and Savior. And if we do, we have forgiveness of all our sins. I was born November 7th, 1918, four days before the end of World War I. I was raised on a dairy farm in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I grew up during the Great Depression, so I learned to have a strong worth ethic. Most of my early life, I woke up at 2.30 in the morning to milk cows on the family farm. I grew up in a Christian family, and my parents were pretty serious about their religion, but I would rather play baseball. I didn't really like going to church when I was younger. I had a lot of energy and was a bit of a prankster. But one day, when I was 15 years old, Mordecai Ham came to our town and started preaching at a revival. I liked to listen to him, but I didn't like when he pointed at me and looked me in the eye. I couldn't sing, but I joined the choir so I could sit behind the preacher instead. <laughs> For three months he preached and I wrestled with the Lord until one night in 1934 I gave my life to Jesus and committed my life to serve him. After high school I went to Florida Bible Institute and Wheaton College in Chicago where I met my wife. We graduated college in the summer of 1943. We had five kids and lived in North Carolina. I dedicated my life to spreading the words of Jesus Christ by preaching the gospel. I emphasized salvation by faith and started in, starting in 1947, I began holding citywide crusade meetings across the United States. And 
and all around the world. All kinds of people came to my crusades to hear me preach. Young children, grandparents, teenagers, sick people, poor people, wealthy people, people of all kinds of backgrounds committed their lives to Christ. I preached to millions of people all around the world from Ethiopia to Russia to New Zealand. In 1973, I preached to more than one million people crowded in a plaza in South Korea. This was the largest event of my crusade. I even shared the gospel in communist countries, including parts of Soviet Union, China, and North Korea. I met, my, I met many famous people and world leaders. I gave spiritual counsel to many presidents. I prayed with every US president from Truman to Obama. I tried to stay out of politics not telling Christians who to vote for. I was a champion for desegregation. I denounced racism when desegregation was not popular. I held desegregated crusades even in the deep south during civil rights era. I knew Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. who encouraged me to lend my support to the cause of ending racism. I declined invitations to speak in South Africa. I proclaimed Christian, Christ belongs to all people. He belongs to the world. And I reject any creed based on hate. Christianity is not a white man's religion and I don't let anybody ever, don't let anybody ever tell you that it's white or black. After terrorist attack of 9-11, I addressed the nation from the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. to offer hope and healing and spiritual guidance. I was a voice of hope during times of trial. In 2013, I gave my final message through more than 408 TV stations across the U.S. and Canada, and more than 26,000 churches participated in this project. On the week of my 95th birthday, I died February 21st, 2018 at 99 years old. During my ministry, I preached the gospel to over 200 million people who attended more than 400 crusades, simulcasts, and even evangelistic rallies in more than 185 countries and territories. I reached m more, I made, I reached millions more through TV, video, film, and the internet, and 34 books that I author. I was, an evangel I was an evangelist who shared the good news all around the world. Who am I? Uh, someone over there. I don't know. Someone. Yes. <laughs> Um, that concludes our 2024 Faces of History. Let's uh, give a round of applause to all our students. And our students. <laughs> Thank you, Essential students, for such an entertaining night. Um, we have some refreshments in the fellowship hall, so you guys can make your way out there after this. Let's make sure the essential students get to uh, get some food first, and then the rest of you can follow. Have a wonderful night, and thank you all for coming out.